I am so ridiculously excited about my next guest. We get a lot of people writing autobiographies these days. Sometimes they're about 23 and all they've ever done is perhaps release a couple of singles or try to sell things on Instagram. But this is a man who's actually got something to tell us about an extraordinary life. Uh, he is the astronaut Tim Peake and he's released his autobiography Limitless and I'm so delighted to welcome to the studio. Good morning to you. Good morning, Julie. I'm um, holding up this because we've got a lot of people watching on video. It's a, it's a wonderful book. I love that it. it says uh, Tim Peake, Limitless and Soldier Pilot, parent, astronaut. Why is astronaut the last of those four words? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I thought that there was an interesting strap line and I, I'm so glad that we got parent in there because that is an instrumental part of, of your life and, and becoming a parent for me was a huge change in perspective. Um, but astronauts at the bottom, it doesn't mean it's the least important, it's just where it ended up. Yeah, it was kind of a big deal. It was kind of a big deal. <laughs> I mean, you, you did some amazing things when you were in space um, and, you know, running marathons and, and the like. I mean, as if, oh, you know, I'm in, I'm in space. Is that not enough? I'm going to have to run a marathon for charity as well. You're kind of over the top. You do make the rest of us who watch a bit too much daytime telly, frankly, feel a little bit guilty. But you have packed an awful lot into... A, not very long life uh, 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 so far. Um, let, let's talk about when you were in space, because, I mean, so much focus and, and you being a British astronaut, going up into space uh, and you were up there for a long time, lots of experiments. Um, I know this is a terrible question to ask, but do you ever get bored in space? Well, and that's an important question, but you don't. I, I don't think you're allowed to get bored in space because the space agency just keeps you so busy and crew time is the most precious resource up there. So we're working flat out 14 days, 14 hour days rather, and then we're preparing for the next day, the next day. Weekends, you get some downtime, but rather than being bored, you need it. You need it to just kind of drop the tempo a bit, gather your energy for the yeah. for the next week that's coming. So you never get bored. Never, never. get bored. I, 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 I'd assume you wouldn't. It would be the most amazing experience. Tell us what a normal day was like when you were in space what sort of things you would do you know how you ate how you slept how you I suppose also crucially you know how you managed to keep mentally and physically fit as well yeah so I mean the, the things that are normal in space and they help to give you kind of structure and routine you've got a small crew quarter the size of a telephone booth and uh, and a little sleeping bag and two laptops in there so uh, and that's that's a nice your own personal space and it's nice to have some private space otherwise it would be you know horrendous for six months with nowhere to go where you could just kind of get some time yourself we all eat together around a small galley table uh, there's bags of food you kind of dig into a bag of food uh, so breakfast is really easy. It just might be some porridge with ad hoc water or bacon sandwich or something, cup of tea. A bacon sandwich? You could actually eat, I, eat a I cup of some, bacon sandwich? I had some canned bacon sandwiches, which okay, got sent yeah. up there. Yeah. But, it was, I mean, presumably it, everyone's allowed a special treat. That's the thing that, that was, you wanted. That was my special treat to start the day. Um, a, a little bag of Yorkshire tea and then off we go. And, and you know, I, and it was great because that normalises the situation. And it's not normal working on the space station, being in space. So to have those things that kind of normalize your situation are so important uh, and then no two days are the same really I mean we, we do lots and lots of science activities but the science is always changing different experiments um, and then sometimes a cargo vehicle will be there when we're really busy unpacking it or repacking it with rubbish if it's about to undock and come back spacewalks happening uh, every few weeks uh, capturing you know these vehicles with robotic arms um, you're not just floating casually around the earth and and, and just hanging out this is it's this a is busy a busy job. station it's a busy station and I'm, but in terms of, I suppose, the personality type of people who can cope with this. Now, your background, of course, is is a pilot. You know, you, you can do all the technicals. That's that's your background. Um, but do you have to be a certain kind of person? Because we know that when you were on our TV screens nonstop throughout that period and the build up to that period, there were so many young people who were inspired uh, to go and work in this field and wanted to be astronauts. Oh, God, I loved that. We want to get so many more kids into the worlds of science and exploration and, and, and all of this. Um, and, and then grow great careers um, but but is there also not just being clever and being a pretty darn courageous as well is, is it being a certain sort of personality where you can cope with being cooped up with other people for months and months and months on end definitely and that's something that the space agencies they really focus on during the selection process we we have psychological screening throughout that year-long process and, and soft skills are so important um, because they really take the the attitude that we can teach you the hard skills we can yeah. teach you you know everything you need to know about the technical aspects of the space station flying a spacecraft robotic arm blah blah we can't teach 
you about your soft skills, your personality, your characteristics, and all those really interpersonal skills that are really, really important. So that's vital to, to being able to get along with the crew members in space. Yeah, well, I mean, look, look this, uh, this trip to your mission to the International Space Station was, was four years ago. You've flown over 3,000 hours on operations worldwide uh, in terms of as, as a veteran pilot as well. Um, I, I suppose there's also an element where you quite literally coming back down to Earth. Is it, you had a lot. I mean, you were being very much celebrated. You win all the newspapers, all the TV studios. As well, is there an element though? Actually, coming back down, you've tra- spent years training to go on these missions. Coming back down to earth is is a real downer. Do you do you get low? Do you get depressed as a result of coming back to ordinary real life? It's a really harsh transition. Actually, it's one that we probably pay the least attention to because all of our trainings, you know, it's focused on the mission and and getting you into the right uh, place mentally, your positive mindset, and all the skills that we need to do the mission. Um, and whilst you're in space, you're very isolated. So I wasn't aware of the impact the mission was having. I was just yeah. on a Saturday afternoon recording the videos, sending them back down. Yeah, I mean, was huge um, at the time. Uh, uh, yeah, really and I would just be getting blocked. And there's no two-way video, so I wasn't seeing any reaction. Uh, very few people can email you. No one can call you. So we're completely isolated. And I came back from the mission, and suddenly you, you kind of have to pick up your life again. And it feels very out of control because you've got this burgeoning inbox, thousands and thousands of emails. You've got PR machine that kicks in. You've got the science team that kick in, and they want yeah. you to use your body for all the data. And you just want some time to process what you've been and through see your and family, to presumably. see your family and readapt and it is hard and and in addition to that you've got the the kind of mental low of having done something uh, that you know you might not ever live up to again in your life so you're dealing with that as well yeah. it's all very difficult were you ever scared I mean, what was the worst thing that happened when you were in space the the worst thing in terms of nerves i think and, and anxiety apprehension was the manual docking right at the beginning of the mission uh, because we uh, the automatic docking system failed Yuri, our Russian commander, had to take control of the spacecraft manually and fly it in. And the first approach really wasn't going well. It came close to a collision, um, and we didn't know that until we. I don't know much about video space. Back. I'm going to go. That's, that's not a good a, thing. That was not a good thing. <laughs> Uh, and um, and we were aware in the spacecraft things were not going well. So I think that's the, the moment of greatest anxiety. But um, uh, the spacewalk as well, only only before, because you, you worry about things before they happen. So that's when you're apprehensive. But actually out on the spacewalk, as soon as we got out there to do the job. Loving it. Loving it. <laughs> loving it every moment. It must just be it's extraordinary. Wonderful. I mean, I get excited just when I'm on an aeroplane and you can see the curvature of the Earth. And that is that still blows my mind every yeah, single yeah. time. And you were just watching the Earth. It's how unbelievable. Many, how many sunrises and sunsets do you see a day? Uh, sixteen space? a day. If you of want each. to stay up twenty four hours, yeah, yeah. So sixteen sunrises, sixteen or uh, well, sixteen sunrises and sunsets, like eight, eight of each. Um, Absolutely extraordinary. It is extraordinary, uh, and it's just be- every time you look at the Earth, you see something different. You see something else catches your eye. Weather systems or parts of the world you haven't seen before. It's just absolutely beautiful. It is stunning. I understand there was a particularly unpleasant day that wasn't necessarily involving being uh, being at risk for your for your safety, but was actually a, a rather pleasant moment inside the space station yeah we had we had a few but there was uh i thought it was important to include the funny moments and the things that go wrong so uh tim coper was digging around in an, an old cargo vehicle one day and his foot kicked the top off one of our solid waste containers and when you uh, say solid waste I th- yes yeah, yes, yeah, folks, yeah, yeah he does mean it's that kind of that waste. solid waste and i i don't know how old this container was so there's a lot of gas that had built up in it and it literally exploded off and i was working down the opposite end of the space station at the time and just i smelt this horrendous smell <laughs> and i came down the space station and i said to, to tim and scott Kelly, I said, we've got a real problem in the japanese laboratory it suddenly stinks up there and they said, they said it's not coming from the japanese laboratory <laughs> <laughs> and it was, it was permeating through the was whole it, space Was it station. just gas or were there little bits floating around? The little bits, are, thankfully, were contained oh, in the bag. I don't know why I'm asking it was that. A, this time it was we... a terrible clean-up that operation. Does, that does sound absolutely horrific. Um, and, and when you come back to work, I mean, making, you know, get, getting used to real life again and, and, and making use of your limbs again... Is it, is it quite strange you walking on the ground, having proper gravity? I know you've got, you know, you, mm. they, they ways, you know, you can run on the on the, the treadmill and things. We saw you doing that uh, when you did the marathon while you were up there. But but getting used to just really practical things like walking on the ground and not yeah. being able to just sort of pull yourself along and float 
It does. It takes a, a, a bit of time to get used to. The first two days are actually really unpleasant. You're, you're, it's, it's more to do with vertigo and feeling nauseous because your head is spinning. And, and I'm not quite sure why. I think it's this mixed mismatch when you first get into space between your ears and your eyes. Uh, and your ears have to almost switch off. And you just your brain wants to just know what your eyes are seeing because, you're, of course, all the fluid in your ears is floating. So it's telling your brain completely the wrong information. And when you come back down to Earth, I think your brain's trying to work out what's going on again between your ears and your eyes. And you feel nauseous for two days it's horrible and what was it like for those left back on earth um because i can't imagine what it would be like for me if my my husband uh, or if my father or mother or went off into space Mm. you've got two young boys you've got a wife i mean how did they manage and how do you all manage when you come back and, and dad is suddenly back you know back yeah, there every yeah. day do you know i think the space mission was perhaps the easiest part because at least i was in one place for six months it was really hard the two and a half years beforehand when i was jetting all around the country all around the world sorry training in all these different locations and I, i'd kind of come in like a bowling ball for two weeks and then i'd be off to japan and then back again for a week off to russia for six weeks and i was away a lot and it was very disruptive to family life so the six months on the space station was a long time obviously to be away from your family but I could call them uh, every day I could have a video call once a week and and they knew where I was so obviously there's a level of risk that yeah. they're having to deal with there um, but it was actually it was at least they could get into a routine. Quite exciting for your sons though because you know every parent has had that situation where you know, get asked to come into school and talk to the class about you know what you what you what your parents do you know so me it'd be like oh I talk on the radio my husband's in IT imagine the kid coming into class going <laughs> My dad's an astronaut. I mean, you, you know, you're going to win that one, aren't you? <laughs> I think they they enjoy that. The funny thing was in, in Thomas's class, my eldest, um, he was going to school with Luca's daughter. Luca was my Italian astronaut friend. So you're two kidding of the dads, me. Two of the dads were astronauts I mean, all the, all the, the accountants in, the, in, that, uh, in that class going, really? Brilliant. We, start, only, we stack shelves in Waitrose. There was only Brilliant. one fireman, yeah, but Absolutely. two astronauts. I love it. Now, let's, let's ask just finally also about the future, because this is, this is what's happened so far. Yes. Um, there's all this talk about space missions to Mars you know and going back yeah. to the moon as well would you like to do the moon would you like to go to Mars Gosh, I'd love to be involved in the Artemis program and the moon mission. Yeah, I mean, the space station's going on till 2030 at least. So that's going to be the yeah. bedrock of what we do. And, and hopefully there's a second mission for me. Um, a couple of my class rates have already had their second mission and Tom goes next year. So, But the Artemis missions to the moon are really exciting. So back there, 2024 is the plan, boots on the moon. That will first mission will probably be two Americans. Yeah. But after that, Europe is very much involved in this program. So yeah. there's there's room for you. Mars, though, very different uh, sort of mission, isn't it? We're Mars talking is de- years, yeah, Mars years, is, years. Is, is uh, a three-year mission uh, that's a real commitment so right now with the boys the age they are I, I wouldn't want to be away for three years from them uh, but I don't think Mars is going to be realistic until the 2030s when you're older and they're older when I'm older they're older so never say never I might be too old by then I think that might be for the next generation I'll but... read that autobiography <laughs> but I'd read this this honestly I haven't had a chance I've only got given it this morning but I'm, I'm genuine I'm going to read this somebody who's actually written done something with their life worth writing an autobiography about uh, Tim Peake Limitless uh, the autobiography it's absolutely superb it's such a privilege to uh, meet you thank you very much Likewise. for joining us thank you very um, much